You speak fluently. <laughs> Beautiful language. Okay, we'll give this class in Croatian. Molim, molim, slušite. Kako se? I don't know so much, I just a few. Beautiful language. You, sh you know, you should always put the next verse on the board, whether it has purport or not. You, this is 44? But 40, 45? No, listen what I'm saying. Put the next verse on the board, whether it has purport or not. Because you're skipping a verse, and then you have to go back. I know what you do, but it's wrong. You put the following verse on the board. The verse was 43 yesterday? You put 44. You, do four, you read the verse, and you read 45 and do the purport. That way, the reading is sequential. No, everyone does it. But we don't even read the purport. We just read the word for word, and we go back to the other verse, read the verse, and go back to the original verse, then read the verse in purport. So you're going, you're going like this. It's not so bad, but it just makes more sense to do it sequential. You know, even if it doesn't have a purport, and then you just read it, and then you go on to the next verse and read and do the purport. Yeah, because if the theme flows from verse to verse. Everyone does it. <laughs> it's not a not a you can give me the book if you want it's nice to have a book <laughs> Bhagavad Gita mm, that one Voila. Voila. <laughs> Punya Voila. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking Croatian today. <laughs> I just found out. All these years, I never knew. Hmm. Ah, I preach in Croatia. That's my main place. Yeah. Uh, very beautiful language, but very difficult to learn. <laughs> if you're not born there, it's it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Subal, can you speak? Can you speak Croatian? <laughs> it's some embarrassing words. Like, I could see, name up problema. <laughs> Sorry about that for those of you who don't know what we're doing. <laughs> okay.
जय राधा माधवा कुंज बिहारे जय राधम माधवा कुंज बिहारे जय गोपी जनवा गिरीवर जय गोपी जय गोपी जनवा गिरीवर So this is verses 44 and 45, 44, 45 is on the board. Tavai Raja Prakritasya Te Vai Raja Prakritayas 
ತಮಸಮೂರ್ಚೇತ ಸತಂ ವಿವೇಶ ಆಕ್ಷೇರೂರ್ ಆಗತ ಮೃತ್ಯವ ಪ್ರಕೃತ ತಮಸಮೂರ್ಚೇತ ಸತಂ ವಿದೇಶ ಆಚೇರೂರ್ ಆಗತ ಮೃತ್ಯ ಮೃತ್ಯವ ಪ್ರಕೃತ ತಮಸಮೂರ್ಚೇತ ಸತಂ ವಿದ್ವೇಶ ಆಚೇರೂರ್ ಆಗತ ಮೃತ್ಯವ Hmm. All the Asuric ministers Vai Indeed Raja Prakritya Surcharge Surcharge with the mode of passion Tamasa Overwhelmed by the mode of ignorance Mood Acheta Saha foolish persons satam of saintly persons vidvesham persecution acheru nerur acheru executed arat agata mrityava impending death having already overtaken them Okay, so read 44, uh, which is the previous verse. These demons, the followers of Kamsa, were expert at persecuting others, especially the Vaisnavas, 
and could assume any form they desired. After giving these demons permission to go everywhere and persecute the saintly persons, Kamsa entered his palace. Surcharged with the mode of passion, passion and ignorance, and not knowing what was good for or bad for them, the Asuras, of whom impending death was waiting, began the persecution of the saintly persons. Srila Prabhupada's purport. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita 2.13, Dehinos minyata dehi kovaram yovaram jara tata dehantara praptir dirastata namuyanti. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. The self realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. Irresponsible persons surcharged with passion and ignorance, foolishly do things that are not to be done. Nunam pravata kurute vikarma. But one should know the results of irresponsible actions as explained in the next verse. So the next verse is the last verse in the chapter. It doesn't have a purport. I'll read that. Tomorrow we can begin chapter 5. My dear king, when a man persecutes great souls, all his benedictions of longevity, beauty, fame, religion, blessings, and promotion to higher planets will be destroyed. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Guru Maha Sri Chaitanya Menobistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam dadanti swa padantikam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Hmm so yeah what is to be done and what is not to be done we have to learn both. <laughs> Learning one is important, that is, what is to be done. But we nullify what is to be done, the benefits of what we do positively when we do the wrong thing. We nullify the results of that. So, therefore, to know what is not to be done is considered to be the principle of Vaishnav culture. Uh, as Prabhupada said, one has to cultivate knowledge and nations side by side. Nations is uh, how the material world works, and therefore very carefully avoiding the traps of material energy. So not knowing that, not to be done. So, but here we got the demons are angry. So this is something that is unavoidable. You always do the wrong thing when you're angry, generally, because angry, anger destroys intelligence. Only those who use anger as a service, they can use anger and somehow advance by using it. But generally, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Dayate Vishayam Pum Sam Sangat Sanjayate Kama Kama Koda Vijayate. So by developing lust, and lust becomes unfulfilled, anger arises. When anger arises, then the mind becomes bewildered, and then when bewilderment is there, then intelligence is lost, and one again becomes victimized by the material energy. So, learning what not to be done is also one of the main principles of execution devotion service. Srila Sanatana Goswami explains in that one verse, it's actually a verse from the Hari Bhakti Vilas. I don't know the Sanskrit, but in that verse he mentions the six symptoms of surrender. And this is important to understand because when we ask, some people ask, well, what is surrender? If you know these six things, then you can mention, and that is surrender, and what are they? to accept things that are favorable and to avoid 
things and not to accept things that are unfavorable. To know that Krishna is your only maintainer, protector, and provider. And then the last one is humility. You see, these are the six principles of, of surrender. So the second one, pratikul, means uh, avoiding those things that are not favorable for the execution of devotional service. And so there's so many rules and regulations. You know, the scriptures are full of do's and don'ts, vidis, things to do, the shadas, things to avoid. And one of the, and that falls into another larger category called Vaishnav etiquette. What is the proper behavior of a Vaishnav in different circumstances? So the, the behavior is the principle and the circumstances is the detail. How to apply the detail in the, the principle in each and every circumstance. So the Vaishnava etiquette, as mentioned, is the ornament of a Vaishnava. One who behaves properly is also able to execute devotional service successfully. A proper behavior and proper etiquette, which is the expression of that behavior, is uh, fundamental to one's practice of devotional service. I'll use an example just to give a little bit of a detail when we pay obeisances. So paying obeisances is actually a very important part because as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, manmana bhavamad bhakto mam yuji mam namas guru. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer your homage unto me. And then of course the rest of the verse, if, if you do this, you know, then you'll come back to me because you're my very dear friend. He's speaking to Arjuna, but he's giving the principle for all of us. And so offering obeisances is actually one of the main principles. So sometimes we just, um, when Prabhupada would be in his room and uh, his personal service would come in and out to do service, he was teaching to us Western disciples what it means to to be in the association of a self-realized soul or such a great person. So coming into that association requires obeisances. And Prabhupada made it where even when you left, this was also proper to pay obeisances coming in and out. So sometimes when devotees were doing service, they would come in and then they would pay the what they call quick obeisances, putting the head to the floor and then coming back up immediately. Uh, Prabhupada said, what is this hatchet? <laughs> choo -choo. Hatchet goes up and down fast. So he, he made that point, particularly when it came to his personal servants. And he makes that point in the song too, Shri Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sarva Bando Muhi Sarva Dana Mate, that line. Bando Muhi Sarva, I pay my obeisances with great awe and reverence. So it becomes a function rather than an expression of devotion after a while. And we lose the mood. Oh, okay, here I go. Time to pay obeisances. <laughs> so um, that and then how to pay obeisances is, is also part of the etiquette. So there is uh, full obeisances, they're called dandavats, and then there's uh, what we do what is called five-point obeisances, when five, five points hit the, the head, the hands, and then the, the knees, like that. So, therefore, one should properly do this, and that is called Vaishnav etiquette. If we should curtail that, shortcut cut that, or somehow even don't do it, because sometimes I see devotees, they go down and don't touch the floor. They just almost get there <laughs> and come back up. So I'm just using that as an example on how etiquette is actually uh, expressed in that particular context with obeisances. Uh, 
So Prabhupada's instructions for etiquette are scattered throughout his lectures and through his books. There has been an effort by some senior devotees, especially Bhakti Charu Maharaj, to put it together in the form of a book. So this etiquette if, means there's things you have to do and there's things you have to avoid. So by doing the things we do, we get the benefit, and by doing the things we avoid, we nullify the benefit we get from the things we do. <laughs> we not nullify, we reduce. In other words, it causes us to either commit offense or a transgression in the, in the process of proper behavior and devotional service. Etiquette is such a big part of devotional service that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu glorified Sanatan Goswami. And he said, you, your behavior is the best. You are the, I can't remember the exact verse, it's from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, I think it's chapter four of Anchalila, verses 129 through 131. I can't remember the exact discussion, but Lord Chaitanya is really glorifying. And he says that even though you are beyond all the rules and regulations, you are the ideal example of Vaishnava behavior because you know that to teach by example is also the principles of a great soul. So he glorified. And then he said, Vaishnava etiquette is the ornament of a devotee. So, and then the example is given that if one is dressed very nicely, and then they have an out, just like ladies, they might put a, a nice jewel on their clothes, then that jewel becomes a kind of an outstanding feature of their dress, and it's noticed easily. Or one may, may wear a flower or something that becomes easily noticeable. So you, Lord Chaitanya, using that example, said that Vaishnava etiquette is the ornament of a devotee like that, and proper behavior. So here, when we speak here, we're talking about demons. And Prabhupada makes the point, they don't know what to do. <laughs> and what is that? What is that verse from the uh, Bhagavad Gita 16.7? Anybody know that ever? Cha nivittin cha. Na chaucha ma bicha charo. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to avoid. <laughs> they no no good behavior, no cleanliness, no truthfulness is found in them. So that's a demon. And here we're hearing about demons. <laughs> And what are they about to do? They're about to persecute personalities. They're very expert at causing uh, distress to others. Just like the word Ravana. Ravana we know as a personality, but what does the actual word mean? The word means one who causes one causes one who causes others to cry. <laughs> that is the actual meaning of the word Ravana. <laughs> So he was expert at making people unhappy. <laughs> a devotee has to be expert at making people happy. <laughs> that is the principle of devotional service, is to cause people to, to experience happiness in some form or another, <laughs> like that. I remember I was sitting with a large group of senior devotees. This was in the New York Temple back in 1999. And they all sat around and they were discussing what is the most important thing that we can do in the expression of our devotional service. Now, how do we express our devotional service in the best possible way? And one senior devotee said, we have to have be in the mood to make everybody happy. <laughs> and I thought, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. So that may take different forms by giving people knowledge. That's one form of experiencing happiness. By um, inspiring people in their own devotionals. And there's, there's so many ways to make people happy. Sometimes we tell jokes 
just to create a little bit of laughter within the environment. So these things, uh, I thought that was a very interesting statement by this senior. I won't mention the name because that's that was his mood to somehow whoever he was around to bring some kind of pleasure to that person and without losing the focus of Krishna consciousness. So that's an art. That's an art to keep it on Krishna consciousness and to somehow or other cause one uh, to feel some satisfaction by that association, by that association like that, bringing the light. But the demons are the opposite, and they just want to cause everyone distress. And the last verse in this particular chapter says that when a person persecutes, when a man persecutes great souls, whatever he has achieved in, in the terms of longevity of life, physical beauty, fame, religious credits, piety, blessings, and elevation to higher realms, all that is destroyed like that. So, like that. So they, we, we call that the... Uh, what is that called? The uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, elephant offense, the one that uproots the creeper of devotional service fast. <laughs> the example is given: if you have a nice garden, and there's so many wonderful things in the garden, then you invite an elephant into your garden. Uh, he's not going to sit there and cultivate the garden he's going to change the structure <laughs> it's going to be he's going to be doing kirtan in your garden <laughs> so then what happens the whole garden becomes destroyed so therefore this principle of avoiding is they're persecuting but even offending a great soul then who's a great soul sometimes we have to question that well for a devotee who has proper vision, they see every devotee as being a great soul. They say, therefore, they avoid committing offense even to persons who are considered to be maybe not very advanced. But even beyond that, one of the offenses is to commit offenses to non-devotees, people who are in the material world. I remember there was one very senior devotee. He was uh, on the plane. And you know, if, if you travel, you know that in some places, as soon as the seatbelt sign goes off at the end of the flight, it's a mad rush to get your luggage. And sometimes you get 100 people in one space that's big enough for two. <laughs> all crowding in it. <laughs> Especially in India. <laughs> <laughs> so he was in a hurry obviously he was late for wherever he was going so he was trying to get out of the plane faster and he was a sannyasi and he was dressed as a sannyasi and some one lady said she turned to him and she said does your religion teach you to be impolite whoa I think you know who I'm talking about and he just, okay, he got it and changed, so. So, yeah, that would, that would be somewhat offensive to people in the material world. So, therefore, even that, devotees are very sensitive to. Not like, oh, they're rotten karmis, doesn't matter. <laughs> they're under the influence of the material energy, so, you know. We don't really have much respect for them. No, it says that a devotee sees within the heart of all living entities Krishna. So even for the non-devotees, one respects the non-devotees. Vidya, Vidya, Vinaya, Sampane, Brahmi, Gavati, Hastini, Suni, Chaiva, Svaparkecha, Pandita, Samadarshan. So this verse helps us to understand what is the proper consciousness of a devotee, he sees that every living entity is part and parcel of Krishna, no matter what body they're in. And then the etiquette is how to treat that 
living entity according to time, place, and situation like that. How to interact, how to not interact. So what is the mood? The mood is service. The mood is service. So a devotee thinks, how can I serve in this situation? Whatever situation it is. And the demons are thinking, how can I get sense gratification in this situation? How can I use this situation and the people who are in this situation to facilitate my enjoyment? Like that. That's a demoniac mentality. And if it's exasperated, enhanced, then it becomes a form of persecution to others like that. But the devotee thinks, oh, here's an opportunity to serve this living entity. And so therefore, if I serve this living entity, I can also serve Krishna by serving this living entity. So sometimes it is necessary to give service. And sometimes it is necessary to serve by accepting service. <laughs> and this is also a point. To receive service from others is also a form of service by you when it's necessary to, to accept that person's service on behalf of that person and something that may be also benefit for you that you can use further in your own service. Like we take prasadam. <laughs> we are, we're actually doing service when we take prasadam because it's called prasadam seva. <laughs> Not like prasadam, uh, let's go for the gusto. <laughs> prasadam seva. <laughs> it's the mood is to try to honor prasadam as Krishna has come. Prabhupada was amazing. When uh, sometimes devotees, not knowing the situation, would walk in with prasadam, would Prabhupada would be there maybe talking to someone. And then they would bring Prashadam in, and then probably said, oh, Prashadam has come, and then like that. Sometimes he would see them coming and say, wait. <laughs> but when Prashadam comes, hey, that's Krishna. Therefore, you have to give immediate attention to the Krishna coming in the form of Prashadam. So that's, that's, that's a kind of a subtle etiquette that we may not always be aware of. But these are the things that make up the culture of Vaishnavism. The mood is always a mood of service and the mood of surrender, like that. Surrender to the service, basically, like that. So, um, but the demons, Prabhupada says, they're foolish. Why? Because they're in the modes of passion and ignorance. You can't do the right thing when you're in the modes of passion and ignorance. You might think, I want to do the right thing. But you can't. Even if you want to, you can't because you're afflicted by these modes and these modes force you to think and act in the wrong way. Okay, so I'll give you an example. In the Shrutis, this is the Vedas itself. I forgot which part of the Vedas, but it says that Let me see. If you're an unkind person and you want to be kind, well, you're unkind, you're crooked, and you want to straighten out, it will take you 10 years. If you are not austere, and you want to be austere? No, okay. Let me. Let me. I think it's not years. It will. It's, what is it? Hmm. Okay. Okay. If you're if you're not unkind, and you want to be kind, it'll take you. a hundred efforts before you can make it. If you're not austere and you want, 
if, and you want to be austere, it will take you 10,000. And if you don't have love of God, and you want to have love of God, it will take you a lifetime. <laughs> this is the Shrutis. <laughs> so even though if you want to be what you want to be, don't expect to happen immediately. <laughs> There's an effort that comes and one has to grow into the quality that one wants to develop. Of course, that's expedited or sped, speeded along by the quality of our sadhana, by the quality of our sadhana. Yeah, as we perfect our sadhana, we become more and more uh, able to speed these things along faster. But this is a general principle that is just giving for people in general. It's not like for devotees like that. So, yeah, therefore, everything is cultivation. That's why it says Krishna conscious cultivation. It's a cultivation of the desired goal constantly. And so, therefore, one has to be always aware of what is the etiquette within the, the time and place and apply that. But the basic etiquette, aside from the details of expression and how to act, is the mood of service. So when we're in the mood of service, we are able to, able to get the mercy of the Lord. When we're in the mood of enjoyment, or personal enjoyment, then it's hard to bring that mercy about because it, uh, that mood blocks Krishna's mercy. It blocks. So the, the demons, they, can't, they can get the mercy of the Lord in the form of suffering. That's all they can get because their mood is simply to cause harm or what we say, um, distress to others. And Prabhupada mentions one should know the results of irresponsible actions. Now here's an interesting point. One should, sometimes we make a mistake and then the results comes and we're unhappy or sometimes it causes us some uh, regret afterwards. So Prabhupada said one should see the results before the action. In other words, one should say, all right, I'm about to do something. What will be the results? And therefore, plan how to bring the best possible results with the proper consciousness and the proper action like that, both. So Prabhupada uses that. He says, an intelligent person will see the results before the active. Just like sometimes devotees keep saying, you know, I keep getting the same results all the time. I don't know why. Well, you know why? Because you're doing the same thing over and over again the same way. <laughs> but we, because we're creatures of habit, and habit is second nature, habit is something that is acquired, but once it develops, it becomes almost like your nature. You, sometimes you act out of habit more than you do according to your nature. And you develop a second nature. So how is habit uh, or something that is unpleasant or unwanted habit, then you have to practice that thing you want to be. And by re practicing that thing you want to be, it replaces that other habit, but it takes time. And so I'm using it like that. Just like sometimes people say, well, yeah, I'm getting up at five o'clock. I want to get up at three okay so you think all right instead of setting my alarm for five i'll go for three it may not work <laughs> you're, you're habituated to get up at five you might have to go back 4 45 to the first day 4 30 to the second day in other words bringing cultivating that in a very uh, practical way where you actually bring about something, and once you bring about it, then it becomes your second nature, it becomes a new habit, like that. When we just like, sometimes devotees think, all right, yeah, I'm gonna do it right now, I'm gonna be a pure devotee, I'm gonna get it all right, and it's shoom, and what happens? 
we seem we go back to our same way. <laughs> so it takes a lot of thoughtfulness and practice. That's why Krishna consciousness never get discouraged because Krishna consciousness works. <laughs> it works. But we have to practice it. And as Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is simply practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice what you want to be in terms of your consciousness and develop the right mood to bring about that consciousness. Like that. So it takes practice. It's the whole process is to practice like that. Okay, any questions or comments? What to be done, what not to be done. Yes, Mataji. Um, <clears throat> uh, Maharaj, <clears throat> there was the statement you'd made that anger could um, perhaps be used even in devotional service. Anger has? Anger being used in a positive way if one's using it in the devotional realm. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so I was uh, reflecting that um, um, and connecting it to the um, um, well, let me try and carry on. So <clears throat> if, um, if one is observing, let's say, um, that there's performance of um, external mm -hmm. um, something Activities. in the devotional realm by someone, but at the same time, the person is performing an extremely sinful activity. So, um, but one oneself in observing from the outside experiences anger, knowing the truth of the matter. Um, yeah. And that anger can go on because one's constantly seeing that and knowing the actual case. Uh, what would be the way to um, deal with that kind of anger? Huh. Well, I think there's, there's variables in the answer because it, the main thing, it depends on the circumstance. Now, if it's a person that you know, you can't approach and it won't work, and then the best thing is to tell someone else who's maybe in a senior position to speak to that person or somebody who's close to them. That's one way. The other way is to be, to use finesse and somehow uh, push that anger you're feeling to the back burner because by responding angrily, sometimes you just create more and more difficulties because people a lot of times people don't respond to anger they become also more upset because of that when you're working with a child that's different and you can use but when you're working with a grown-up generally you have to speak what you want to say in a very pleasing manner satyam priyam satyam bruyam one should speak the truth in a pleasing way so as not to cause the situation to become more, you know, volatile by bringing anger into it. Um, that's a general understanding of how to see the situation and how to respond. But sometimes I mean, Prabhupada would get angry sometimes, but because he was a pure devotee, his anger was never uh, a cause of distress for others. It was always a way to correct. Um, well, we might not be able to do that always. <laughs> um, when in doubt, tell others, bring others into it and ask them what you think should be done with this situation. This person keeps making the same sinful or causing wrong activities and it's causing distress to me and maybe to others also. So, 
Yeah, you have to be careful not to make it worse in the form of trying to correct it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you wait till later when the person is away from the activity. Like one of the things I see, like in this temple, which is very disturbing to me, but I don't say anything because it's always at a time when I can't say it. And that is, when the RT goes on, you can't sit down. RT means everyone stands. That's how you respect the deity. As soon as the RT goes, everyone gets up. But I see even devotees who are initiated, who live in the temple, they sit on the benches during the RT. That is wrong. And if you're in association with certain senior devotees, they'll tell you, get up like that like Dravida was telling me um, how in New Vrindavan now New Vrindavan they do Nishringa Arti separate from the regular Arti they do an Arti for the deities Mangal Arti and then when the Shringa prayers come they bring another tray and they offer articles to Nishringa Dev and you don't sit you stand. Now, it's commonplace to sit during the Shringa prayers. But the Shringa Arti and the Shringa prayers are different. So when the Arti is going on to the deities, no matter which deity it is, you stand <laughs> like that. So I see that and I think, hmm. But now I see it during the Arti and it says you should instruct people in front of the deities. That's another offense. So I'm committing offense to try to overcome another person's offense. So I just figure I'll just wait till later if the opportunity comes like that. <laughs> like that. Like this morning I was instructed during RT and I didn't say anything. I just remained quiet. And I didn't like what the person said. But I remained quiet because I knew if I responded, it would make it worse. So anyway, that happened today. So you have to be, we have to be aware of how to follow the etiquette in different situations. And so that may be a little sensitive when it comes to instructing others. So in the book by Bhakti Charu Maharaj, he makes the point he has a whole chapter called Instructing Others. And it gives you some principles and some ideas on how to approach a situation like that. It depends who you are, too. If you're in a position to instruct, that makes it more easier and more authorized. But if you're just a, one of the devotees, then sometimes a person says, who are you to instruct me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> even if you're right <laughs> so that's another so this is a very sensitive and very um, what we say not easy to sort out situation <laughs> I think you just have to use your intelligence according to the situation and either act or not act depending But I think the proper mood is, is important, that we don't want to make it worse by venting anger like that. It says, you can't offend the offender. <laughs> offend the offender. <laughs> um, he's offending, so let me offend him. <laughs> no. That doesn't work either. <laughs> Uh, I'm critical of the critic. <laughs> yeah. So, does that help a little? Yeah. Yes, Subal. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned also in the class that 
um, about doing the right thing and the wrong thing and between the two uh, understanding the things that we should not do is more important no that's not true okay <laughs> well we we will m minimize the effects of our advancement that we make by doing the right things we're doing the right things we're getting we're getting some some success some benefit we're moving forward we get some knowledge we get some mercy but then if we do the wrong thing then it counteracts it doesn't completely destroy it but it minimizes the effects we get from the benefit it reduces it in other words we're, we're going the other way yes okay that that's why behavior is more important than knowing the philosophy Prabhupada said Vaishnava etiquette is is the he said and he said anybody can give a lecture but what is their behavior <laughs> no, that's the, that's the point yeah like sometimes <clears throat> when you you know with oneself in, in one's um, um, uh, process of, of trying to eliminate bad habits and also when you're trying to help someone, another devotee, to, to overcome some bad habits, um, the, the sense of failure of, 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 or the sense of hopelessness in eliminated you know, some very entrenched habit yeah. uh, is, it becomes very prominent. Right. And um, so often we hear, and in sins, you know, I, I find myself telling to myself and also telling to others that I happen to be trying to help um, to focus on the positive part, on the... Um, on the things that we know they are uh, yeah. purifying, you know, yeah. your sadhana, your chanting, that, that you know, these type of things. That's, that has to be there because we actually say if you bring in the light, the darkness goes. But if people are bringing in the light and it bringing in the darkness, <laughs> then, you know, you bring in the light. So the stronger you bring in the right, the more obviously, or more, what's the word, the more uh, you'll be able to push out those things that are, you know, contrary. But in the beginning, our practice may not be so strong. Therefore, we have to be very careful to avoid certain things, which just will cause us to, to go down like that. Like I saw, you know, like for an example, this happened to me, not to me, but it happened around me, or like, like dressing the deities. If you're on the altar, you can't make mistakes there. <laughs> you just don't make mistakes there. <laughs> if you do, there are offenses. It's so close, and that's why Pujari service is very, what we say, um, very, it's like being close to the fire. If you're too close to the fire, you might get burnt if you're not like fire. So I saw one time one devotee was dressing Jagannath and he had to move the deities from one place to another. And he was carrying Lord Balaram and he dropped him. And right after that, his Krishna consciousness went down fast. So, yeah, you just don't, there's certain mistakes that are really costly. <laughs> that's a ex severe example. If you s offend a great soul, that's a very, you know, that's something that can also cause you to go down like that fast. That's mentioned in this second, last verse here. But little, little mistakes, little things somehow or other are, we want to avoid them, but at the same time, they don't have such a severe effect on our Krishna consciousness. But 
Krishna consciousness really means perfecting our mood of service by the proper behavior that comes with that, like that. And people have different personalities and natures and stuff like that, and that's, that's, that's normal. But when we do the wrong thing, then, then that's what is called pratikul, just not acting properly. And there's certain places, such as the temple, which is very much aligned with rules and regulations. <laughs> when you're in front of the deities, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> when you're outside, there's less restrictions to be aware of. <laughs> but we spend a lot of time in front of the deities, so it's very important to be aware of what to avoid. Another principle of etiquette, this is not, this is something that's nice to know, but if you don't do it, you're not wrong, but if you do it, if you don't do it, you don't get any reaction for not do it, but if you do it, you get some benefit. And what is that? taking darshan of the deity. So how to do that? So what is, how do we take darshan? Do we stand there and stare at the deity? <laughs> is that darshan? <laughs> uh, darshan means, Prabhupada says, you pay your obeisances when the curtains open by looking at the deity's feet. You bring your eyes up to the face and then back down to the feet. Then you pay your obeisances. Not like when the curtains open, it's like the first one they hit the floor wins. <laughs> it's not like that. <laughs> that, that. That's actually darshan. And then once you get back up and you're standing there, what do you do? Do you just kind of think, hmm, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. When, when do I move to the next deity? Okay. <laughs> no, the idea is you say three things to Krishna when you're standing in darshan. One is you glorify Krishna's activities. You think of something glorious about the deity. You, you kind of, not vilify, but you put your, you say, my dear Lord, I am so fallen and I am so wretched. I am so useless, but somehow you're so merciful. So, uh, an expression of humility in regards to your own self. That's the second one. First one is to say something wonderful about Krishna in your mind. Yeah. And the last one is, how can I serve you? So, the Prabhupada said, this is darshan, these three things. So, how many of us know that when we look at the deity? Do we do those three things all the time? So if you do it, you get benefit. If you don't do it, you know, it's not offense, but you just missed out on the chance for some, some mercy. <laughs> like that. So, so these, all these subtle things, they're not so subtle, but all these things that make up temple worship are you know, written in instructions given by the spiritual masters or written in nectar devotion. How to best, you know, practice Krishna consciousness while in the temple, like that. So, it says you once, well, I, I won't say this one, I'll, I'll skip it, <laughs> but because it's, it's one we don't follow at all, but it's mentioned in the fences like that. Should I say it? Mataji, can I say it? Don't be offended. It says one should not wear red or blue before the deities. It says one should not wear red or blue before the deities, right? Nectar of devotion. You can read it. Why? Why these two colors? Because they're very bright and very colorful and very outstanding. You're trying to attract your attention towards you. <laughs> So how, how much of us do we follow that? 
says it. It's in the Nectar Devotion. I'm not making it up. You can find it in Chapter 10, I think it is, right? Nectar Devotion. One should not wear red or blue before the deities. But if somebody wears red or blue before the deities, uh, are they going to go to hell? <laughs> Obviously not. But it's, it's, a, it's a little discretion from the, the ultimate standard of etiquette before the deity. I mean, there's a lot of things, but that's one of them. So I don't have that problem because I only have one color. <laughs> but some of us have, have our choice of what colors to wear every day. <laughs> so, like that. But if you want to wear red, it's okay. <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it says that in Nectar Devotion. So there's many, many, many little things that we are not aware of that every day we break because we just don't read the books. We don't read the books. Like I see devotees doing this. If you do that, I mean, that's an offense before the deities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just pointing out some things so just to help us become more aware of the subtleties of of Vaishnav etiquette. There's a funny recording uh, a devotee in the early days I think just after Nectar Devotion came out said Srila Prabhupada why does it say we shouldn't wear red or blue in front of the deities? <laughs> and Prabhupada says because it is red and blue is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> But then there's another, it might have been a letter. I've never heard that one before. Yeah, you can hear that. Um, somebody asked it in a letter also, and then Prabhupada in that case, in the letter, said it's not so important. Yeah. So that's interesting how there's some things that are very important and some things that are just kind of minor details and don't sweat it like that. Yeah, it's not an offense, but it depends how you want to conduct like that. Should I tell you a funny story? This is completely off the subject. I was standing in Bhaktivedanta Manor and it was John Mastami, it was in the morning time. And they do they they dress the deities very nicely and they also add very they ask, they, all, they add things that make up the John Mastami mood. So they had all these cowherd boys on the altar. And they were dressed in all their colors. And so they had, you know, yellow turbans and red dhotis and blue and green and so many. It was really bright colored cowherd boys. So I'm sitting there, standing there taking darshan. I was thinking, it would be nice to wear some of these colors. <laughs> I was thinking I got this one color, you know, it's just like a... So I was just, it, it was a passing thought, but it stayed for a few seconds. <laughs> nice to wear some of these. <laughs> and then the thought passed. So later on that day, John Moss and me, you know, fasting all day. So I come in, I come into the shoe room from outside and I put my Crocs, my shoes inside the shoe rack. And I go upstairs, and then I come back, and my shoes are gone. <laughs> so then it, it attracted attention, and it attracted attention to some of the ladies who work in the kitchen. And all the ladies who work in the kitchen, they have these yellow Crocs, bright yellow. So they came out with a pair of yellow Crocs and said, here you go, Maharaj, here's a pair of shoes for you, bright yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, oh no, Krishna's got a sense of humor. <laughs> and I wore them, but I was waiting to get my old shoes back. <laughs> I didn't really want to wear them too long because <laughs> it was attracting attention. <laughs> so yeah, so Krishna's funny sometimes. <laughs> Thanks, Maharaj, for the class. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You said that uh, um, Pujari women shouldn't wear red or blue because this. Did you hear? 
Yeah, did you hear uh, Sureshwar's response to that? I beg your pardon? Did you hear Suresh Prabhu's response to what, what Prabhupada oh, no, no. said? No, I didn't. Well, then he said, when someone asked Prabhupada, why can't we wear red or blue? Because Prabhupada said, because it's red and blue. Is that all right? <laughs> and that was the end of it. And then in a letter, he said, it's not so important. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, as far as we're, since we're talking about deities and things and deity etiquette, um, I, uh, I was wondering if uh, does somebody need to be um, any kind of initiation before they are able to maybe cook for like say like traveling deities like giriraj deities or i think i've heard some devotees say that uh it's a little more lax uh with like traveling deities but i never really knew the details of that you're asking whether at one stage of your krishna conscious practice you can have deities to travel with is that it um how do if it's possible to cook prashad for deities like giriraj deities for like traveling book distribution or something? I know what Prabhupada would say. <laughs> he would say, it takes away from your preaching. He said that. If you look, I think in the 1977 lectures, when one sannyasi was telling him he has a traveling deity, Prabhupada said, this is not right. He said, you know, you have to preach. And when you want deities, you just visit the temples. You can worship the deities in the temples when you're there. But many of our sannyasis have traveling deities, uh, so many right now. But that statement is there from Prabhupada. So I think the idea is that if you're traveling and preaching, that's the most important thing. If you can do a little deity worship on the side and it doesn't become a burden or a time-consuming thing, like I used to travel with Jagannath all the time. And that wasn't easy. So now I travel, I have a Haridas Dakor Didi. And all I do is offer him boga, that's all. And I, you know, offer him water in the morning and boga. I don't do RT or anything like that. I keep it as really simple, that's all. So, yeah, so if you're out there, you're out there for a purpose. You don't want to spend so much time. Now, if you're a constant traveler and that's your service, then you might get some deities and then put something, do a little here and there, Gornitai, like that. I mean, I know one sannyasi travels with a bunch of shalagrams and he does two hours of shalagram worship every day, but he preaches to people who are presidents of you know, corporations. <laughs> he preaches to people who are, you know, heads of state. <laughs> and he's, he's a, you know, he's a big preacher. He preaches in India like that. So, you know, you can't imitate that. Oh, he has his deities, that's where I can have my deities like that. Yeah, thank you, Ma. I think the, what, the answer to your question is you should get approval from your your authority before you do that. Yeah. That's the best way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Marash. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> adding a follow up question to that can non initiated people do deity worship in their homes, like of Gornitai? Again, it's approval from the spiritual master or someone who is in the position to give you instructions like someone who's on the level of a spiritual master. Generally, disciples always get approval before they bring deities into their worship at home. They always approach their spiritual master. That's the best thing. <laughs> and depending on the person, some people 
he'll say no and some people will say yes and they may be in the same situation depending on the person whether it's good for them or not beneficial or not so like, that one is that one's an approval thing generally that's how it works we get approval on that one but we can always have an altar with pictures Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what if you have deities and um, you always wanted to serve them, but you barely have? And just what little, if you have deities and you know that you should be serving them because that's what you're supposed to do, and you're not really doing that? Oh, you mean you have deities at home, but you're not taking care of them? Correct. Yeah. Well, they're not furniture. Better to give them to somebody who can take care of them. Deities are meant to be worshipped, not just... But also, like, I don't have a Maharaj to, you hmm? know, appro you said you have to have a Maharaj to approve you. I don't have any of that, you know. I don't have, like, an even couple devotees to talk to. But hmm. occasionally I'll do some, you know... I know that I um, make the Indian food and stuff you have to offer. If you have a regulation, that's fine. When it comes to deities, you have to establish some level of regulation. Whether it's small or more, it doesn't matter. It could be just something very simple, but it has to be done regularly. Yeah, that's another thing I should have probably ended with, is that what if you're no. just offering incense and water or something of that well, That's nature? fine, but do it every day. Right. Every day at the same time. That's fine. No one says you have to establish a, a standard, but the most important thing is cleanliness and regulation. These two things. It has to be very clean and it has to be regulated. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Does that help? I think he's Sureshwar is going to help it help it more. Um, just corroborate um, what you just said was uh, basically the same answer that our God sister Vishaka, when she was a new devotee, she asked Srila Prabhupada. Shri the Prabhupada, when is the deity installed? When is when is Krishna present in the deity? And he gave a very simple answer: when the worship is regular. Right. And that makes sense in terms of what Krishna says in the Gita: all of them, as they surrender unto me, I reward accordingly. Right. So the more we're regular and devoted, and uh, yeah, doing it regularly, then Krishna he manifests himself. Yeah. That's one of the ways of installation is time. It's called time. Does that help? Does that help you? Yeah. Just keep it simple, but keep it regulated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Tomorrow's verse is the beginning of the new chapter, chapter number five. Okay. Hare Krishna. <laughs> oh, yes, and and there's a regulative principle is be here eleven o'clock <laughs> without fail. <laughs>